Evening, everyone. We're just going to leave it a couple of minutes to allow people to come in and settle in and obviously looking forward to this next session where we are have all fingers crossed for no glitches if you joined us on the 4th of November. That was a fun one. So we're just going to give it a few minutes to let people enter into the room. We've turned off the chat function, but what we do have is the question and answers section ready for you. And essentially what we'll be doing is we'll be doing both of the webinars first, and then we'll move on to a questions and answer session at the end where Sarah, Zoe and Louise can sort of facilitate some answers to those questions that you raise. So just waiting for a few more to join. So welcome everybody, just again, giving it a few more minutes to let people come in. Thanks for joining us on this stormy evening. Hopefully uh, <laughs> it won't be as stormy with our questions and answers coming through. Wow, we've got a question already, that's good. Get them in early. <laughs> <laughs> What we will be doing is collecting the questions and answers throughout, but then we'll answer them at the end, if that's okay. The numbers are still going up, so I'll give it just one more minute. Appreciate your patience, thank you. Okay, so I think that's given us enough time just to allow people, I'm sure they'll keep coming in, but I'd like to welcome everybody this evening to our second webinar on the management of the menopause fundamentals. We are lucky this evening to have Louise, Zoe and Sarah with us and they're um, Dr. Sarah Ball and Dr. Zoe Hodson will be delivering the webinars this evening and Louise is going to do a bit of an introduction. So I'll hand over to you, Louise and I hope you enjoy it this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy, and welcome everyone. Um, it's lovely to not really see you, but know that a lot of you are here. And this is a the second webinar that we've done uh, for the Society, uh, just to um, let you know the Society is really set up for helping as many healthcare professionals as possible to learn and understand about the menopause. Um, it's officially launching really in January. So uh, what we thought we'd just do these to set the scene a bit. So tonight, obviously, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the society. Sarah is going to talk about feeling confident prescribing HRT. And Zoe is going to talk to us about testosterone, a hormone that I only realised I had um, a few years ago. And then I also realised how much I was missing it a, a few years later. Um, and then we're going to do the questions and answers. As Lucy said, we're going to just do those at the end. We might not be able to get through all of them. Last time we had loads of questions. Um, but uh, we will scoop up as many as we can. So just to really talk about the, the Menopause Society, um, we, it was it, a, lot of, um, a lot of what we want to do is really try and demystify HRT. Um, HRT has been a real um, concern for lots of healthcare professionals, and it still is actually, and it's based on um, poor quality information and research and studies actually. So what we wanted to do tonight was to demystify it for you, make it really simple because in our clinic and in our clinical practice and the way we teach is, is really making it as easy as possible. So um, when I open the BNF, I don't have a clue what half the combination uh, synthetic progestogens with oral estrogens are because I never prescribe them. So Sarah is going to make it really easy for you to be able to describe also going to talk about vaginal hormonal preparations, which clearly are not systemic HRT, but they have a really important role for menopausal and perimenopausal women. Um, and also not just about um, HRT for symptoms, but also um, for health risks, um, reduction of, of some of the health risks. And just we want to keep really abreast with the evidence as it, in, as it increases. Um, hopefully some of the research that we're starting to do is going to make a difference too. So the aim of the society 
really what I wanted to do was bring together healthcare professionals from around the world to really transform care, treatment, education, research of the perimenopause and menopause. And I'm sure you'll all agree the last 20 years, there hasn't been really amazing research in menopause. People haven't been interested in it because they've been scared away by HRP. We're very lucky. We've got 41 people on our advisory board um, with from all specialties actually, and also from various countries across the world as well. So we are going to start a subscription next year, but it is going to be very low cost. And it's we're going to try and do as much as we can. So education is really, really important. We're also going to do a lot of advice and guidance for people to hold their hand, to try and improve their confidence, help with any cl clinical queries, have case discussions as well. We we're involved in quite a few um, research projects with some really key universities, and we're hoping that's going to increase more by collaborating, actually sharing our thoughts, sharing what we can do to make a bigger noise in the menopause space to ultimately help more women, which is what we want to do. And we... Um, going to share all the, our resources that we have. Um, I've got a lot of resources that I've collected over the years and I share with people that work with me, but I want the uh, Society of Youth to be a space where I can share the resources I have, but everyone else can pull theirs uh, as well. So it's an area where we can really access as much information as possible very easily, um, especially as we're all so busy. So just a couple of dates for your diaries. 20th of January next year, I, Rebecca Lewis and I are going to do a, a, just a Q&A. So some of the um, questions that we won't have time to answer tonight, we'll record them and then we'll bring them into the session then. But then anyone else, um, we can do just a, a really open question and answer. And then our, our first proper meeting with the society, to open the society, is Professor James Simon. If any of you haven't listened to his lecture on 14 Fish Conference Menopause course, then it's worth a listen. Um, he's really inspirational to listen to. So we're going to listen to him on the 25th of January. So um, that's all from me. I will pick up at the end with a question. So I'm gonna hand over to Sarah now to talk about safe and effective surviving of HRP. So thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Lucy, can you just confirm that that's sharing? Yep, that's sharing. Brilliant, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. It's lovely to, lovely to see so many participants here. Um, I just wanted to share a, a positive um, event with you today. I was lucky enough to be part of a meeting that was um, involving the MP, Carolyn Harris, about um, trying to improve menopause care. And I just wanted to share this quote that she said, which was, um, what would the world look like if women got their hormones back? Um, and women have been shortchanged for too long and we need to march on with the menopause revolution. So the fact that you are um, here tonight means that you are now part of that revolution. So that's great news. So I have been tasked with the uh, job of talking about prescribing HRT, which is actually remarkably simple. What's a bit more challenging is actually giving a lecture about it, um, which only lasts for 30 minutes. Uh, just bear with me. Um, my slide won't advance. Um, do you know why that might be? No, I don't know if it's because of your in the other setting, Sarah, where you can okay. see the other one. I might want you might want to change your setting maybe and see if that helps. Okay. If I just I stop the share and then yeah, if you do end slideshow and then just if you go back in. Okay. Share screen. Don't know if you can do it without the notes, see if that works better. Let's try it this way. way. There we go, that's better. Thank you, sorry everybody. Okay, so um, I just want to say that I do work in a private menopause clinic, but I do not have any financial disclosures, um, but I do use HRT myself. So what I would like to do is to present a case study to try and set the scene. 
and then to give a brief reminder of the benefits and risks of HRT, which Louise and Rebecca did cover last month. But I think in order to be able to prescribe, you need their voice at the forefront of your mind to hopefully prove that you only need a very limited HRT formulary to cover a couple of conditions that we get asked about all the time in terms of prescribing and also to talk about the prescribing options for genitourinary syndrome of menopause. So I want to start by talking about a typical patient that I would remember very clearly seeing some years ago in usual general practice. And I'm gonna call her Mrs. Half-Hearted for the argument's sake. And she's 52. And two years ago, she started Everell Sequi patches for vasomotor symptoms and also the fact she wasn't sleeping well. At the time, she recalls that her periods had become a bit less frequent and erratic. And as her partner had had a vasectomy, she didn't need any contraception. And initially she did find that the patch worked, but then last year when we hit the HRT shortages, she was moved to LS Duet, which is an oral combined preparation. And she's starting to find that she's getting more hot sweats and flushes again. Her sleep isn't so good. She's feeling very tired low in mood, she's getting very brain foggy, which is causing problems with work, and she's also starting to notice vaginal dryness. Her libido is quite rubbish, so her relationship is also struggling. So she's feeling quite fed up, and she's wondering if she's always going to feel like this. When you ask her a little bit more, it turns out that actually when she's in the first two weeks of pills, which is when you just have estrogen, she feels lower in mood. Um, but then in the second two weeks, things um, go slightly downhill. She feels better in the first two weeks, not so good in the second two weeks. And exactly the same pattern happened when she was using patches. And her periods have got progressively lighter over the time that she's been using HRT. So she actually came and saw one of your colleagues a few weeks ago and she asked if she could try a different HRT because she doesn't think this one's right for her. And she was actually advised then to use antidepressants. And then your colleague also mentioned that she should be thinking about stopping HRT soon anyway, um, because, quote, HRT is very risky after all, unquote. So this has really confused her, and now she's come to you for an opinion. So just to set the scene about HRT prescribing, before the Women's Health Initiative study, which, as you probably know, came out in 2002, about a quarter of women used to use HRT. And now we're 19 years on from that, and it's only about 10% of women that are now using HRT. And so basically all the fear that was caused by the Women's Health Initiative study has unfortunately become very deeply entrenched in both women, but also in us as healthcare professionals. And so despite now two decades of us being able to look back at all that data and scrutinize it and reanalyze it, and actually being able to see that there's very positive and reassuring outcomes of HRT, unfortunately fear sticks. Um, over the time that we've overall been prescribing much less HRT, we've actually had a reciprocal increase in antidepressant prescribing. We've seen breast cancer rates actually continue to rise despite the fact we're prescribing less HRT. And the treatment gap, i.e. the difference in those women who should be receiving treatment, but those who actually do receive treatment for osteoporosis has increased. And the Marmot review from a few years ago actually shows us that although life expectancy for females continues to increase, the years that would be deemed healthy have actually decreased. And so if you remember nothing else from tonight, um, what I would like you to remember is that for the vast majority of women, the benefits of HRT outweigh the risks. So here I am back a few years ago in normal general practice with Mrs. Half-Hearted and I admit what I would have done is reach for the MIMS, open it on my saved page with the table with all the HRT products in it and I would have effectively played a game of pin the tail on the donkey. There's actually 44 products listed in the HRT section and so it can feel like a complete and utter minefield. Had I have known at the time that actually I, if I'd have turned the page, the nice menopause guidelines were there, um, that would have been a far more helpful thing for me to have read. And as you probably know, they've now been out for six years and they have been the pivotal publication really that's restarted the conversation about HRT. So 
I want to talk through the indications for HRT and I think we need to think about the three broad areas when we want to prescribe HRT. We should be using HRT for the relief of symptoms for the menopause and the perimenopause. And by that, I mean all the symptoms, not just hot sweats and flushes. All of the symptoms are valid. Um, and although HRT only has a license for use in postmenopausal women, it is absolutely fine and appropriate and right to be using it in the perimenopause as well. We also need to think about HRT for people with osteoporosis, and it is part of first line treatment for women aged under 60 for osteoporosis. But actually, I think if we do away with the fear which has been attached to HRT for so long, we should actually be thinking about it at the top of our list for women of all ages with osteoporosis. And for women with premature ovarian insufficiency, it's absolutely crucial to offer HRT, even for those who don't have any symptoms because of the poor future health comes, outcomes for these younger women. So this may be a controversial slide, but hopefully I'll explain why. So what are the contraindications to HRT? Well, I wouldn't give a pregnant women HRT and I wouldn't start a woman on HRT who had abnormal vaginal bleeding where investigations hadn't already been instigated. However, I feel that all other contraindications which are probably buzzing around your head are all relative and actually if you have the right knowledge um, which I will hopefully give you now and that you take into account the fact that quality of life is a key factor in HRT prescribing and you respect the, um, the right for women to have an informed choice about their treatment then I think you will also agree that actually there are no absolute contraindications. So why would Mrs Halfhearted choose to continue HRT? Um, and I think of this as the big five. So imagine you're going on safari and we talk about the big five. So these are the five things where the data is extremely long and well-established from very large, well-designed studies, including randomized controlled trials. So extremely robust data. So we know that HRT reduces the symptoms of the menopause and perimenopause. We know that it improves quality of life. And then we come on to the future health benefits and we talk about the window of opportunity and by that we mean the during the time of the perimenopause or within 10 years of your last period or before the age of 60 whichever is the latter and so if you commence HRT within the window of opportunity then there is considerable cardiovascular benefit there is also um, considerable bone benefit, but that is at all ages. And there is also um, considerable decrease in all cause mortality. Now, I have listed the references there, but I'm not going to go through them again because that was covered in the last lecture. But what I essentially say in, in fairly simplistic but easy to understand ways for patients is we know that HRT will roughly halve your risk of future heart disease it will roughly reduce your risk of a future fracture by about 30%, and it will roughly reduce the risk of actually dying from anything by about 30%. So the benefits are absolutely crucial to talk about, but there's also a lot more benefits, and there's a lot of increasingly robust data for these things. They're just not so absolute set in stone. So there's also reductions in the risk of dementia, osteoarthritis, type two diabetes, bowel cancer, mental health problems. We know also that the improved immunity that HRT affords us means less outcomes with all infections, but we're finding that out particularly with COVID at the moment. And there's the massive societal benefits, which uh, Rebecca spoke about last time in terms of the workplace and the economy. But of course, in order to be able to prescribe HRT confidently, we have to talk about the risks of HRT because that's essentially what's been stopping most people uh, asking for HRT and being prescribed HRT. So I want to talk about the three risks, which um, are, are the ones that, that trouble us the most. So firstly, clot risk. So we know that if you use estrogen via the skin, then there is no increased risk of being a thromboembolism. We know there is a small risk with oral estrogen. And we also know that there's no significant increased risk 
of VTE if you use micronized progesterone. And we'll come on to that again in a moment. We also know that if you've had a previous venous thromboembolism or you have a prothrombotic condition, such as factor V Leiden mutation, that you can use transdermal estrogen as it does not increase your risk of clot any further than it is already. Then going on to cardiovascular disease, and of course, we've just talked about the benefits to our cardiovascular system if we start within the window of opportunity, but beyond the window of opportunity, which for most women is over the age of 60, we know that oral estrogen uh, shows actually no evidence of benefit or harm, no matter how old you are. We know that if you use combined oral HRT, then there is a small increase in the risk of coronary heart disease. We know that if you use estrogen via the skin, this has a cardioprotective effect. And we know that using micronized progesterone actually helps to support the cardioprotective effect of estradiol. And the third risk, and the one which most people worry about the most, is the breast cancer perceived risk. So we know from the Women's Health Initiative study that certain groups do not have any increased risk of breast cancer, and they are um, women that are using estrogen only, HRT, so in other words, those that have had a hysterectomy, where we know that actually there were less cases of breast cancer in this group. And we also know that younger women, um, i.e. those using HRT below the age of 50, do not have an increased risk of breast cancer. So with combined HRT used over the age of 50, there was in the WHI trial a very small increase in the risk of breast cancer, which was about in the area of nine extra cases per 10,000 women. So I simplify that for women and say it's in the order of about one woman per 1,000 per year. And that is deemed a very rare risk. And actually it did not reach statistical significance in this trial. We also know with a later French study called the E3N that there was no increased risk of breast cancer with up to five years of using combined HRT if micronized progesterone was part of that HRT. We also know that using any type of HRT does not increase your risk of dying from breast cancer. Also importantly, we know that about a third of breast cancer cases could be prevented with lifestyle alterations. And many women who are suffering with perimenopausal and menopausal symptoms are struggling to improve their lifestyle. And also, you may well have received two years ago the letter from the MH MHRA um, advising about the risks of HRT, but that was actually based on very dated meta-analyses where no micronized progesterone was used and also didn't include data from the WHI or the E3N data, which are very positive about HRT. It also failed to mention any of the benefits of HRT, and therefore, um, that has not been at all a, a helpful document. So essentially what we need to think of HRT as is a potential promoter of breast cancer, but it's not the initiator. And I've unashamedly stolen these quotes from a lecture that I heard earlier this year, which I think helped to put the risks into context. So um, by understanding common risks while exaggerating exotic ones, we end up protecting ourselves against the unlikely perils whilst failing to take precautions against those most likely to do us in, and none is more the case than with HRT. And also that research has shown that strong beliefs about risk once formed change very slowly and are extraordinarily persistent in the face of contrary evidence, which is probably why people like us are still here giving these type of lectures. So, Let's take that information and go back to the back of MIMS and actually let's get rid of the things which we already know we probably should not be using for optimal HRT. So let's get rid of the oral estrogen products and let's get rid of the ones that contain synthetic progestogens. The one exception to that being the Mirena coil, which is a very useful device as we'll talk about later. So we've whittled these systemic products down to just nine. So we really want to think, simplify HRT prescribing by just thinking about using gold standard HRT, which would be considered to be what we call body identical 
all regulated bioidentical hormones. So that includes having estrogen through the skin. So in other words, a patch, a gel or a spray. And then for those with a womb, they need either micronized progesterone or a Mirena coil. And then they may also well benefit from testosterone, but I will leave that part of um, the lecture to Zoe. So thinking about transdermal estrogen, as I said, we've got our two main brands of gel, we've got the spray, and we've also got um, the patches. And so we already know there's no clot risk from using transdermal estrogen, and they can be used with those with a history of a clot. And we also know that transdermal estrogen doesn't affect our sex hormone binding globulin, which means it doesn't decrease our libido any further than our libido may already be decreased in the menopause. So we should be considering transdermal estrogen for women with any risk factors for clot. So they may be um, obese or smokers or have a history of diabetes or migraine or gallstones or liver issues. But actually it's far easier to just think of transdermal estrogen as your first line estrogen. Why would you use any other type? There's really very few reasons to. And it's really helpful to have a table or idea in your mind of the equivalent doses. Um, so we know that one milligram of oral estrogen, which is what was in Mrs. Halfhearted's LS duet, is about the equivalent of two pumps of estrogel or a milligram sachet of Sandrina or a 50 microgram patch or about three sprays of Lenzetto. Now, we also know that Mrs. Halfhearted's symptoms were actually coming back which isn't surprising because she's in the perimenopause and our dose tends to need to go up as we approach our last um, uh, period. And so actually with her, I would probably switch her to gel because that's what she's chosen. And I'd probably increase it up to three pumps of gel to start with. So from a practical point of view, I always think of using transdermal estrogen as getting on a ladder. We would usually start at a low or medium dose and work up gradually titrating against the women's symptoms. Um, and also remembering the fact that the perimenopause marches on. And so what dose suits you today may not necessarily suit you in six months or a year's time. Hence, we need regular reviews with these ladies. We need to show them how to use the product. Otherwise, there's no point in them having it. So it's really helpful having placebos on your desk that you can just show them how to use them. And we always advise about initial side effects so that women aren't put off their HRT. And that's usually breast tenderness, nausea, headaches, indigestion, bloating and bleeding. And it's absolutely crucial as well to advise women not to read the patient information leaflet because they will put anybody off anything they mention um, all HRT as a class and therefore don't actually refer to what the woman has been given. I also advise women that we all absorb very differently and we all have different sensitivities to estrogen. So it's not a one size fits all. And it's something that we will may need to adjust the dose as we go through. And some women do need higher doses than that which are licensed. And that's especially the case for women with premature ovarian insufficiency or menopause that occurs below the age of 50. And we need to reassure women about this. And I say it's not what you put on that counts, it's what actually gets in. And that can be very variable. It can be helpful in this situation to check their estradiol levels um, as a reassurance method. And there is actually no good evidence to suggest that the progestogen dose needs to increase just because the estrogen dose has, unless there is bleeding occurring. So in terms of deciding which regime of HRT we need to use, we need to ask some fairly simple questions. Is there still a uterus? So if there is, they need progesterone. If there isn't, then they can use estrogen only HRT. The only exception to that I tend to find is those women with endometriosis post hysterectomy where we know there's some residual disease left behind. So they should have progesterone as well. So for those women that still have their womb, we need to know when was the last period. If it was over 12 months ago, then they are postmenopausal and therefore they need continuous combined HRT. So in other words, estrogen all the time and progesterone all the time. And if they're less than 12 months since their last period, then they can have 
sequential or cyclical HRT, where they just have the progesterone component for the latter half of the month. However, having said that as well, there are a few exceptions. Continuous combined HRT can be more appropriate even in those who are still perimenopausal if they have conditions which are triggered by fluctuating hormones. So perhaps such as migraines and endometriosis. And when should we transition from the sequential regime to the continuous? Ideally, if you're over 50, it should be after about a year of sequential use. And if you're younger than 50, it may take a little bit longer, maybe a couple of years. We just really need to avoid leaving women on sequential HRT for more than five years, because that's when the um, evidence that endometrial hyperplasia kicks in may then start to take effect. So micronized progesterone um, is derived from yam plants and it's termed body identical. And therefore, if you look down a microscope at it, it's actually chemically and um, molecularly identical to what our ovaries used to make. And therefore it has metabolic and biological effects which are actually completely different to the synthetic progestogens that we have been used to using. And so the type of progestogen used really does matter and is really the crux in terms of um, safety of HRT. So if we use the Eutrogestan, which is the only micronized progesterone uh, product available, we know this improves cardiovascular risk and lipid profile. It has either a neutral effect on blood pressure, but it also can improve blood pressure. There's no clot risk. We know there's no increased breast cancer risk for up to five years of use. And beyond that, the evidence is limited, but it would seem uh, the, the right thing to presume that as micronized progesterone doesn't have any uh, proliferative effect on breast tissue, that that safety would likely continue. We know there's less side effects with micronized progesterone. It's in the region of about 10%, but that's compared to the 40% with the synthetic progestogens. And we know that Mrs. Half-Hearted was almost certainly getting side effects with her synthetic progestogen that she had in her previous combined HRT products. And eutogestan can be extremely helpful for women in menopause because it's sedating and it also helps to reduce anxiety. So the dose of eutogestan, um, the license for it is for oral use and for perimenopausal women, they should be using two of the 100 milligram capsules each night for either 12 or 14 consecutive nights each cycle. And for women who are postmenopausal, they need to take the one 100 milligram capsule each night. They can, if they wish, take it for 25 consecutive nights out of 28. Um, but actually, that can lead to women not. Um, not remembering their eutogestan. So for most women, it's just better to do it every night. Now, we do know also that eutogestan can be used vaginally and it's the same capsule. You don't have to switch products. It's the same capsule um, and the capsule can be inserted with a finger. It doesn't need an applicator. And this may be an appropriate route for either those who don't tolerate progesterone orally very well. So if they experience low mood or gastrointestinal side effects or breast tenderness, there may be people with uh, pre-existing gastrointestinal conditions like um, inflammatory bowel disease or irritable bowel syndrome, and they want to avoid the, the GI tract if possible. Those who bleed may want to use eutrogestan vaginally. As the eutrogestan is closer to the womb, it, you have more bang for your buck if you use it vaginally. Vegans may choose to use it vaginally because eutrogestan does contain gelatin. And just for personal choice, some women may want to use it vaginally. Unfortunately, it isn't licensed this way, but it's extremely commonly used this way. And um, I often reassure women that in France, that is the, the norm there. So the dose is using vaginally. Um, as I said, it's still the same capsule as they were using orally. And if the woman is intolerant to progesterone, which is the reason why you're moving them to vaginal use, then you can halve the dose because, as I said, you get more bang for your buck when you use it vaginally. And there is data um, 
going back to a review article in 2016, which does state that vaginal micronized progesterone used at this half dose may provide endometrial protection for three to five years. And so um, it's, it's a very useful way of dealing with progesterone intolerance. So if you've got a perimenopausal woman, she could use 100 milligram capsule of eutrogestan vaginally once every night for 12 or 14 consecutive nights each cycle. And for a postmenopausal woman, she could use a 100 milligram capsule on alternate nights continuously. As I've already said, the Myrena coil is an extremely useful device, especially for perimenopausal women, but it can also be used postmenopausally as well. It's the only option that we've got, which is licensed as both the progestogen component of HRT and also as a contraceptive. It can, it's, its license actually states that it's for endometrial protection for four years, but the faculty guidelines are quite happy um, and it's standard procedure to use it for five years. It's the very best option for controlling and eliminating bleeding. And there's very low systemic absorption. So of all the systemic or the synthetic progesterone, sorry, it's the least, um, it, it's gonna have the least effect on us systemically. There is a little bit of conflicting trial evidence about the absolute breast safety of a Mirena coil. But overall, if there is any breast risk, it's likely to be extremely low. If it, and it's also a great option for those with endometriosis. The downsides of a Mirena are, of course, that it does involve a procedure and not absolutely everybody can get a Mirena coil fitted, for example, nullips. Some women will experience side effects in the first three months and bleeding can take some months to settle down. And there is a few women who will not tolerate the Mirena coil. There may be a few women who really, really would like an oral preparation. Um, and so if you are going to um, go for this, then I would suggest one of two um, products. The first one being Femiston. So this contains estradiol and a progesterone called didrogesterone. And we refer to didrogesterone as body similar. So it's sort of a halfway house between body identical and synthetic. Um, so because it's got oral estrogen in it, I still wouldn't use it for anybody with risk factors for cardiovascular or thromboembolic disease. Um, but for anyone without those risk factors, then it is um, the best of the oral combination products. The main limitation for something like Femiston is that the amount of estrogen in it is quite low dose. So you don't have any wiggle room to increase it if you need to. Hence why body identical with your separate building blocks for the hormones is usually much better all round. There is a new product on the market in the last month or so called Bijuve, which is probably worth a mention. So this is a new combined oral body identical HRT. So it contains 17 beta estradiol, but it also contains the, the micronized progesterone all in the same tablet. And it's the Replenish trial, which has been, um, had the most data on this so far. And this looks over the course of a year at women between the ages of 40 and 65 who had vosomotor symptoms and 400 odd of them were using Bijuve and 150 were using placebo. And their hot sweats and flushes did reduce and their sleep improved as did their quality of life. And importantly, there did not appear to be an increase in the VTE risk. So that is, is very reassuring. There was only one case of endometrial hyperplasia with it, which was the same as in the untreated population. This study isn't long enough to properly measure breast cancer safety, but the mammogram findings are comparable to placebo. And it doesn't appear to have any clinically meaningful impact on our lipids, our sugar, our blood pressure, our coagulation, our liver, or our weight. So in terms of specific um, uh, prescribing areas, these are the two questions that I get asked the most questions about. Firstly, can I give HRT to somebody who is older than 60? And the answer for me is usually a resounding yes. So there is no age at which I consider HRT um, to be given at too old an age. The woman actually may still be within the window of opportunity if you revisit this. So for example, if she had a menopause at the age of 55, then actually she's within her window of opportunity to 65. 
archive and a lot of people uh, forget that, that detail. And it's not at all uncommon to have symptoms persisting um, beyond the age of 60 that adversely affect quality of life. The difference really is that there just won't be so many benefits if you start the HRT beyond the window of opportunity. But we know the bones will still benefit even with very small doses of estrogen. And as we know, because we're using body identical HRT, there does not seem to be any evidence of cardiovascular harm. The other uh, question, which also causes a lot of confusion, is can I give HRT to someone who has had breast cancer? And this is obviously a very individualized um, uh, consideration, but it is possible. And we know that menopause after breast cancer can be especially harsh, and these women can have a dreadful quality of life. We know that HRT shouldn't be first line treatment for these women, and there are alternatives that can be considered as well as lifestyle advice. However, we should actually judge each case on an individual basis, looking at the woman's individual circumstances and tumour details. And this should ideally be done by somebody confident in menopause care, and ideally with the involvement of her multidisciplinary team if she is still under a breast surgeon and or an oncologist. But there's actually no good quality evidence that using HRT after breast cancer is associated with an increased risk of recurrence. And that is often quite surprising to, to many people. So we need to um, involve the patient in a decision um, about her care. And so, for example, when we talk about tumour types for ductal carcinoma in situ and estrogen receptor negative tumours, it actually may be considered um, relatively safe to prescribe HRT, as long as we always try and stick to body identical types. And both of these documents, the GMC guidance from last year and the NICE shared decision making guideline from this year are really, really helpful with prescribing anything, but especially HRT. And it tells us how important it is for us to listen to our patients, to hear about what matters most to them, and to acknowledge that different people will have different views about their own care and those views may differ from our own and that is okay and we're there to support them not to tell them what to do. So just to remind you from the NICE uh, menopause, not the NICE menopause guidelines, the NICE breast cancer guidelines, that we should stop systemic HRT in women who are diagnosed with breast cancer and we shouldn't routinely offer these women um, HRT but in exceptional circumstances we can offer HRT to women with severe symptoms with the uh, discussion about the associated risks. So when do you stop HRT? And reviewing HRT is really important, ideally every three months until you get settled onto a regime that suits you, and then annually thereafter. But there is no maximum length of time that anybody can take HRT. So we would consider that there should be no arbitrary limits based on either age or the amount of time that you've been using HRT and that it can be continued for as long as the uh, benefits outweigh the risks, which for most women is lifelong. Many women will have menopausal symptoms after stopping HRT, and that's not because the HRT has allowed you to kick the can down the road, but because their symptoms would have been there anyway. And lower doses of HRT are usually more suitable for older women because our pharmacodynamics alters as we get older. So I want to talk a little bit about genital urinary syndrome of menopause because it is so, so common. Um, most women will get some symptoms affecting their vulva, vagina or bladder as they go through either perimenopause or postmenopausally and for the rest of their life. And this is a huge taboo area and therefore women are needlessly suffering. We know that two thirds of women won't ever actually seek medical advice and the ones who do have usually waited many years before actually seeking any help. And just to try and um, clarify this in a pictogram, out of every 100 women who are postmenopausal, at least 70 of them will experience some symptoms of GSM and only about 20 will seek help. And really sadly, only about seven of them will actually get appropriate treatment. And so it's really important that we ask women about these issues. 
And we need to really think very early on about local oestrogen treatments for these women because they're very simple and effective. They lower the vaginal pH back to its usual acidic environment, thicken up the epithelium of the vagina and urethra, increase the blood flow and lubrication to the area and bring back the normal urogenital flora. It can take a few weeks to months to work, but the earlier you start the treatment, the better. So we've got more products now to use than we used to, which is a great thing, but obviously it then causes slightly more confusion. So I think of them in three main groups, two of them that contain um, estrogen um, and one that doesn't. So of the two groups that contain estrogen, the first one to think about is the ones that contain estradiol, which is these three products here. So we have the good old cart horse of vaginal estrogen, which is Vagifem, which is a 10 microgram pessary, which you insert every night for two weeks and then twice weekly after that. And then there's the newer identical pessary, but which is more eco-friendly called Vagirux, where there's just less plastic waste because there's um, a reusable applicator in the box. And then there's also the really nifty little E-string, which you've probably seen the flexible transparent um, ring, which gives a very small amount of estradiol gradually into the vagina and you leave it there for three months. So they're really handy for women who are a bit forgetful or those that aren't very dexterous. And they can be helpful for, for example, your um, residential or nursing home patients um, where they may have uh, urinary symptoms or prolapse and an E-string can be really helpful, even used on its own or aside a PVC ring pessary. And then there's the second group which contain estriol, so just a slightly different estrogen receptor that it's going to stimulate. So some women will get on brilliant with estradiol containing ones, some people with estriol containing ones, um, and some people both, and very occasionally neither. So going from left to right, we've got the weakest through to the strongest. So Invagis is called ultra low dose. Um, this is like a really waxy, lubricating, bullety type pessary and you insert one every night for three weeks and then twice weekly thereafter. Then we've got blistle gel, which is just a little bit stronger, which can be used externally or internally. Again, once every night for two weeks and then twice weekly after that. And then we've got the two estriol creams. We've got the more dilute one called estriol, but the applicator contains more volume of the cream. This does contain peanut oil, so beware any allergy sufferers or, or those with contacts with allergy. And this should be inserted every night for two weeks and then twice weekly after that. Or there's the slightly more concentrated version of this called Ovestin, where um, it's stronger, but there's less volume in the, um, in the applicator. So I think of them a bit like the difference between orange squash and orange juice. They both tend to do the job, just some people have an individual preference. And then there's the third group, which are the ones that don't actually contain um, estrogen, but are hormonal. So there's intravosa, which is DHEA pessaries. So DHEA turns into estrogen and testosterone in the vagina. And that's a once daily pessary, which is used um, ongoing. And that can be helpful where in the few people where vaginal estrogen doesn't help. And there's also the one oral uh, treatment for GSM, which is called Sentio, and this is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. And um, I have found this helpful in a few older ladies who have such bad um, uh, prolapses that they haven't actually been able to insert anything vaginally. We must not forget that there are non-hormonal options, and these may be appropriate for women with extremely mild symptoms, but usually. Um, it's more appropriate to have some estrogen going in and then also using vaginal lubricants and moisturizers as uh, additional help. And these are good brands for women to consider and they can all be prescribed on an FP10. So the take home messages about local estrogen treatments are that we should treat earlier rather than later. The symptoms won't get better on their own and they will worsen as time goes on. Again, tell the patient to ignore the patient information leaflet. It will talk about the risks of systemic HRT, not that they're 
are, are any really, as we've already discussed, but they will frighten the woman if you don't warn her. It can take about three months for the beneficial effects to happen. Um, and initially there can be a bit of irritation and itch um, in the first few weeks if you warn them about this, uh, but uh, reassure them it will usually settle down. We should review treatment after three months. And if it's not working, we should reconsider the diagnosis and, and make sure that you know, we haven't missed something else like lichen sclerosis. But effect, essentially most women just need their dose increased a bit and it's perfectly safe and effective to increase the dose above um, the starting doses, which I mentioned, to either alter the type between the different groups of hormonal vaginal treatments we talked about, or combining their vaginal treatment with systemic treatment if they have any other menopausal symptoms or want to help their future health. We need to advise women that their symptoms are highly likely to return if they stop the treatment and that reassure them that the, the treatments are safe for as long as needed and therefore it's safe to put these on a repeat prescription. It's also entirely safe to use vaginal oestrogen for those with current or past breast cancer. There is no evidence to suggest an increased recurrence risk and it's absolutely fine to use vaginal oestrogen alongside HRT and in fact about 20 to 25 percent of women who are on optimal HRT will also need some vaginal oestrogen to help their symptoms. Remember about lubricants and moisturizers as well and remember you do not have to give a progestogen or monitor the endometrium for women using just vaginal oestrogen. Just back to NICE menopause guidelines again, and just a few things I wanted to raise. One of the points does mention that um, we should consider um, vaginal oestrogen if HRT is contraindicated, which usually is, we're talking about breast cancer patients, if you seek advice from a healthcare professional specializing in the menopause. I would argue that given the safety of vaginal oestrogen, you don't need to be a specialist to make that call about vaginal oestrogen. And similarly, it suggests increasing doses of vaginal oestrogen if a lower dose isn't working in, in um, conversation with a menopause expert. Once again, I would argue that that is um, not useful NHS resources and that um, anybody can increase the dose of vaginal oestrogen if they have the confidence to do so. And so this is a useful document if you want to read anything more about genital urinary syndrome of menopause and especially including with breast cancer, um, you can uh, Google uh, BSSM GSM and this document will come up. So going back to Mrs. Halfhearted and a reminder of what we've done, we've hopefully reassured her that HRT is a safe and effective option for her to continue with. And we've switched her from her previous synthetic HRT to body identical HRT. So we've put her on estrogel three measures daily because she clearly needed more estrogen than she was previously getting. We've going to switch her from sequential to continuous combined because she'd been on her sequential for two years and her periods had lightened and she was clearly ready to do so. And we're going to add some badger ups for her vaginal dryness. We've reminded her not to read the leaflets in the packets and we've also given her some advice about lubricants and moisturizers and asked her to come back in three months to check that all is going well. We, at which point, of course, we can consider testosterone, which will almost hand us nicely over to Zoe. Just a few more resources for you on the Balanced Menopause website. There's lots of individual um, items about every possible thing you could think of with menopause and HRT but you'll see there on the left is the easy HRT prescribing guide which is essentially a concise way of saying everything I've just said in the last half hour or so. There's also lots of uh, resources related to uh, GSM which are very helpful for you to give to patients and there's also a host of really helpful resources that you can give to patients with breast cancer as well. And Last but not least, if you want to read anything really exciting um, and inspiring about HRT and why oestrogen is so important, this book, Oestrogen Matters by Professor Blooming, is right up there as a top read and you can claim some CPD. So I hope that's been helpful and I am now going to hand over to Zoe so that we can hear more about the third hormone, testosterone. Thank you.
right, let me see. There we go. All right, Lucy, can I just check that that's working? Lucy? That's working. My unmute thank button wasn't working. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so thank you to everyone for turning up tonight. Um, I know it's, as I say, it's, it's a cold wintry night, but I'm just going to do a whiz through testosterone because I'm sure that we will be discussing it many, many times in the society. So just a bit of a quick introduction. Um, again, during my GP training, I think I had two hours of training on HRT and didn't have any training whatsoever on testosterone. And I'd seen a few people on testosterone, so I assumed that it had to be done in secondary care. It was all very complicated and then have started prescribing it very frequently and have become more and more frustrated by several things. Firstly, that it's not accessible widely in general practice. Um, and also that there is very, very little research on it, which I think in this day and age is, is just bizarre. So let me just. So my only declaration is I am on testosterone and have been for 18 months and it is my favorite hormone. So when we're looking at, I'll just do a quick sort of whiz through the, the biology. So we know that testosterone in females is also on a feedback pathway. So it goes through the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and then via either the ACTH or FSHLA down to the adrenals and ovaries and feeds back. So we would get roughly 50% from the ovaries and 50% from the adrenal glands. And it is actually a very normal female hormone. So premenopausally for assigned female at birth, we actually produce three to four times the amount of testosterone than estrogen from the ovaries. So what tends to happen with it, as you can see, so the bottom line is your estrogen and the top line is your testosterone. And you can see really this sort of steady decline from late thirties. And you can see why most of the people we see in the clinic at age 50 are starting to experience quite significant symptoms with it. So the reason it can have such wide ranging symptoms is this is a picture of where we have testosterone receptors throughout the body. What was really quite upsetting is when I went to try and find when I went to try and find this picture, I looked for a female form with testosterone receptors and there wasn't a single one on the Internet. So we've had to get our IT team to doctor this form. But as you can see, we have testosterone receptors throughout the body. And I think once we're aware of this, it makes sense that when we come to the symptoms later. Zoe, would you mind just going on to present uh, mode, just because it's a bit small, if that's all right. Where is... If you just go to top right, where it says present. Oh, there we go. Is that better? Yes. Oh, it's gone back to the beginning, that's fine. That's okay, we'll just squeeze through. Thank you. Oh no, it's gone back again. Oh. You just click present there. There we go just whiz through again. Thank you. Is that better? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So these are common fears that we hear. Um, and I think probably from both healthcare professionals, it was my fears when I first started prescribing it and um, women and people that come through to the clinic. So I think the commonest one is in regards to facial hair, losing hair on the head. There, used, there was some data that it could give you clitoromegaly and decrease and lower your voice safety. And again, more from healthcare professionals are queries about whether it has an adverse effect on the heart and the liver, and also about the possible risk of breast cancer. So what we know is that although the so the preparations that we use haven't been around for as long, they've been testosterone implants have been used since 1938. So they have been used in females for a long, long time. There were reports of liver toxicity, but this only links to the oral testosterone, not the transdermal testosterone that we use. 
Again, we know that the, this, the transdermal testosterone doesn't affect the liver or the cardiovascular system. And although there are only small studies on transgender patients, there's no increased risk in cardiovascular outcomes, mortality, or breast cancer. There's also some really interesting data coming through that we'll talk through later about testosterone and breast cancer. And we know that actually it's showing that it can inhibit the estrogen progesterone induced breast cell proliferation. We also know that it has a beneficial effect on glucose metabolism and can reduce insulin resistance and help with lipid profiles. So what we're looking for, because again, many women that we see in the clinic have started to experience a little bit of facial hair and they have experienced some thinning hair on their heads. So we're looking for the balance between all of the hormones. So we know that if you have already started to decrease your estrogen, you can start to become more insulin resistance, resistant and this will push it down a, a pathway where you, again, the balance between the estrogen and testosterone has changed. And this can trigger the, the slight loss of head hair and the increase in facial hair. So this is partly to do with the testosterone axis and the sex hormone binding globulin. It can also be linked to your genetics. What's really important, and this is what we stress time and time again, that if we achieve normal female testosterone levels, then we, we do not link it to androgenic or the side effects listed. So this is what I'm talking about here, and this is how to calculate it. Testosterone on its own is not particularly useful. We're looking for something called the free androgen index, and this is the calculation to achieve that. So we need both the testosterone and the sex hormone binding globulin. So the sex hormone binding globulin is possibly a blood test that you might really only have come across if you're in, in younger women when you're looking for things like polycystic ovarian syndrome, when you may have done this axis before. So we know that these conditions can increase the sex hormone binding globulin. And following on from Sarah's talk about the oral estrogen decrease in libido, this is the mechanism by which it does. So the oral estrogen will increase the sex hormone binding globulin. And again, if we go back to that slide, then we know that this will have an impact on the free androgen index and that affects the available testosterone. So we also know that the sex hormone binding globulin can be increased by active liver disease, gradually getting older, anorexia and hyperprolactinemia. It can be decreased, and this is possibly what the um, ratio that we see more frequently in clinic. So in women who've had a history of polycystic ovarian syndrome, by obesity, non-alcoholic fatty liver, Cushing's, hypothyroid and diabetes. So if you're doing this axis and the sex hormone binding globulin is low, those are the pathways that we need to start to look at and we may sometimes need to do some work on those to just almost increase and free up the free androgen index. So when we're looking at who we should be discussing testosterone replacement therapy with, we would say in particular women with premature ovarian insufficiency. As Sarah said, it's really, really important that they have their hormones replaced. We know that surgical and medical menopause is becoming more common, particularly with things like cancer treatments, and it can be a, a really quite brutal menopause. And especially if you've had, for example, um, bilateral oophorectomy, then you've gone from, as we saw earlier, you've gone from 50% of your testosterone supply suddenly being taken away. And again, in a similar way with chemo radiotherapy to the pelvis, it's a very sudden drop in hormones and can be particularly severe. The more commonly known criteria that we should be, we should be looking at is loss of libido or, or hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And really, we would say that any perimenopausal or menopausal person who wishes to discuss it. So these are the symptoms of testosterone deficiency that in the clinic we see day in, day out. And again, when you go back to looking at where we have testosterone receptors, we've got them in our muscles, we've got them in our brains, we've got them throughout the body. So these are the commonest ones that we hear every single day in the clinic. The fatigue is 
again, we've got many different descriptions. And I think my favorite is that it can be like psychologically and physically wading through porridge. You can have really severe cognitive impact with things like loss of concentration, word finding problems is always the stereotypical sort of conversations between menopausal women where they forget their name. You can have a loss of energy as well. You can, we've actually found that testosterone replacement can help with migraines and headaches. And testosterone improves the dopamine and serotonin transmission, so it has a big effect on mood. We know that a low testosterone can have an effect on muscle mass, so replacing it can improve strength. We've had a lot of people who, for example, have been seeing personal trainers and the personal trainers perplexed saying, you're doing all of this work and you're not getting any stronger. And then we measure their testosterone, the free androgen index, and it's incredibly low. And of course, we can have the loss of libido as well. Now, the other thing that we commonly see time and time and time again is women who've been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And it's not difficult to see why, because a lot of the symptoms will mimic. So when we go back to the testosterone ones, they're almost identical. And we are seeing this all of the time with people that have been labeled with not only fibromyalgia, but things like chronic fatigue syndrome. And we go in and check their free androgen index and it's absolutely, it's, it's tiny. They just have no testosterone on board. So this is one of the reasons why, although it isn't commonly prescribed in general practice at the moment, we are really trying to raise awareness of this because even, I mean, myself with 20 years of general practice experience, I just flick back over so many patients that if I had known about this, I could have investigated it. And even if I hadn't been able to prescribe, it could have been considered, I could have referred them to somebody who could because we see these symptoms improve time and time again and relatively quickly, and it makes a huge difference to quality of life. So these are the three preparations that we, we would generally stick with, and I'll come on to where we are with licensing these further, further along. So the one on the right-hand side is Androfem. That's a female testosterone preparation that has been licensed in Australia and they're all prescribed off license in the UK at the moment. It's in an almond oil base. So again, not suitable for anyone with nut allergies. And at the moment it's only available on private prescription. Now there are two other ones because we are getting, and I'd like to say a big thank you to any GPs out there who've been able to do this. We're getting many, many more GPs who are taking over testosterone prescriptions and they very often will request that the patient is swapped to either test gel or test him because these are available in some areas on the NHS. So test gel comes in the smaller sachets. It comes in a pump bottle, but we tend to avoid that because it's more potent and you'll find that your levels will go up and down. Similar with Tostran, we've tended to find that patients who've arrived at the clinic who've been on Tostran Frequently, the free androgen index is out of range, and I think this is to do with the potency of it. So we tend to stick with the little tester gel sachets. So as you can see from that, it's 50 milligrams in a five gram sachet. And we just want, with all of these, our starting dose is 0.5 mils per day. So it isn't ideal because what we'd find, what we'd, you have to do with the sachets is somehow measure 0.5 mils per day, but we have plenty of patients out there who are managing it just because they feel so much better with the testosterone back on board. The testing, again, there, it, it was, there were stock issues before, but there's stock available now. And it's more convenient because it's a little screw top tube, whereas the test gel, we have women that are sort of putting clips on the end, whereas the, in the testing, you can just screw the top back on. Same dose again, so it's 0.5 mils per day and the same dose with the Androfem, 0.5 mils per day. So what we tend to advise is that it's rubbed onto the outer thigh or the bottom, and you rotate the area to avoid any bottom beards or outer leg beards, but this doesn't tend to be a common problem. You really don't have an issue with localized hair growth the majority of the time. 
So we would say that, and again, it's worth pointing out that this is a tenth of the dose that a male would use. So if we go back to these, a male would use an entire sachet of the Testadel each day, an entire sachet of the Testim. And we explain this to women that we speak to, that we only have a tenth of the testosterone that a man would have, and so we only need a tenth of the replacement dose, but it still is a very important hormone. And obviously hand washing after application, and then we wait because it can take time. So very often it will take about four months for testosterone symptoms to resolve. So it is, as I say, it's a, a, I would ask people to be patient and say that it's very slow. It's a slow drip, dip down and it's a slow restoration back up again. So the monitoring now we can do a free androgen index at baseline, and this can be helpful, especially in, as I say, for women who have the, it's more to do with women who may have a decreased sex hormone binding globulin. So as we said, that skews the axis and that may affect, or it will affect the available testosterone. So if women have had a history of polycystic ovarian syndrome, they're pre-diabetic, if they're carrying weight then it, or have had a, a problem with their thyroid or again, things like fatty liver, it can be useful to do a baseline free androgen index. And that's really looking to see if there are other pathways that need correcting first. So for example, we very often will find that nutrition has gone astray during the menopause. And if that is causing insulin resistance, then we find that women can very often change their nutrition, decrease the carbohydrates or go on a, a low, low processed carb diet. And quite quickly, we'll see changes in that sex hormone binding globulin that will then change the free androgen index. So with a lot of women, as I said, they don't have that in their history, then you'll generally find that the free androgen index is very low. So we do, in the clinic, we tend to do the monitoring blood test three months later. And this is for a couple of things. It's just to check the dose. And it's far more common that we need to increase the testosterone rather than decrease the testosterone. So what we tend to find is that the symptoms are generally well controlled with the free androgen index between two to three. And the guidelines are that as long as it stays below five, you're actually fine to continue with your testosterone. You can also ask women to keep an eye out for any androgenic symptoms, such as sort of jawline acne. And if that's the case, they can either get in touch with you, you can do the blood sooner, or they can just reduce the dose a little. So if we've seen them and started them on testosterone and the free androgen index is very low at the three month mark, then we just increase the dose a little bit and vice versa. If it comes back high, and that is pretty rare with the three products that I've mentioned, it's got a very short half-life, so we just so we just ask them to omit it for a couple of weeks, and then you can reduce the, either the daily dose or do it slightly less frequently through the week. It tends to behave itself very, very well, and so once people are up and running and it's stable, we just advise annual monitoring just to keep an eye on the dose and the free androgen index. So where we're up to at the moment is all testosterone prescribing for females is off license. Now, I would, this is something, I had a bit of a project on this year, because at the beginning of the year, I started having a look into the CCGs to see who was supporting testosterone prescribing. Very, very keen that women shouldn't stay under a private clinic just to access testosterone. So we started to have a look into it. I've spoken to many, many pharmacists and CCG leads. And one of the commonest reasons that they gave for not supporting this was that it was off license. Now, we know that 15% of GP prescribing is off license. So I wasn't really buying that as a reason not to include it on the formulary. We have, again, there's been a lot of change over it's mainly England. Scotland is a law unto itself. We're going to tackle Scotland next year. And Wales, we have made some progress as well. So what we've achieved at the moment is to try and standardize the 
prescribing support in the CCG formulary. So again, if you have a look in your local formulary, hopefully you will have seen that A, it's actually been mentioned as a possibility for women. And at the moment in most areas, it's on an amber rating, which means that if it started and specialized, started and stabilized in a specialist clinic, then it can be taken over by GPs. We really strongly feel that this shouldn't be taking up secondary care appointments. It's very easy to prescribe, it's very easy to monitor, and we're hoping that we'll be able to move this to green status with support further down the line. The problem is, is that we have, so with the current guidance, we have a significant lack of NHS menopause clinics. There are long waiting lists for them. And it's a very, can be a very vulnerable cohort of women because they, again, they've got all of these symptoms of fatigue, loss of confidence. It's very often the testosterone deficiency that causes them to be out of work. And it's not a great place to start from to try and battle to get through to an NHS menopause clinic. We know that there's lack of training. So amongst gynecologists, amongst GPs, that the, nobody is getting trained in how to prescribe testosterone or very few people. And again, we're hoping with the society and the work that we're doing and the Confidence in Menopause course, that this will become much easier and you'll have backup to start to either take over testosterone prescribing or even initiate. The other problem, and this is one that I haven't been able to argue with many of the formularies, because they have said that we can't have tester gel sachets added because you can't, it's not ideal to be leaving a half open sachet of a product lying around on the side. And that is something that I can't argue. But Testim, as I said, is in the screw top little bottle. And we are hoping that there will be more products that are actually designed for female use with the smaller doses. So we're getting there slowly. So um, Dr. newson has been in discussion, being part of the panel that are hopefully going to get Androfem licensed by the end of 2022. Pheasants who produce tester gel are working on or they're considering at applying for a license and they have come up with a pump pack and that's in trial at the moment to ensure that it has the right dose and blood levels for women. So there is a tester gel pump pack at the moment, but that's for men and it's more potent. And what we need, again, to avoid these little sachets would be a pump pack that just delivered the correct daily dose of tester gel. As I said, the majority of CCGs have been contacted and we're going to do a rerun of that next year just to check that the ones that promise to change their pathways have had a look at them. And the other thing that you may have noticed amongst your patients is that awareness of the benefits of testosterone is increasing on a daily basis. Was getting a lot of women that are chatting to their friends at work and talking about the benefits of it. And then Dr. Newson is also working with NHS England. And again, Carolyn Harris, who Sarah spoke about, is also very aware of the benefits of testosterone. So we're trying to really sort of chip away at it in all directions. So these are, again, if we start to look at the potential benefits, and again, this is what we see in the clinic and we see a, a huge number of women through the clinic on a monthly basis. And we see this every single day. So we see that mood and cognition significantly improve. And this is really within four months can start. We often see women that are on a stable regime have significantly decreased attendances for things like sort of joint pains, um, for mood, for energy, for all of the things, so things, again, you can see the common conditions. So we find that fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue significantly improve alongside the mood and the pain. And that generally means that women are attending their GP on a much less frequent basis. Again, we see the level of polypharmacy. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's lovely having come from general practice where every time somebody went to a secondary care clinic another medication would be added to the list and what we're finding when in the menopause clinic is we actually see the opposite so when people come back to the clinic their big bag of regular medications is gradually being chipped away 
because they no longer need things like the antidepressants, they don't need the painkillers. And it's, it's really nice to see this after 20 years of general practice. We see many, many women getting back to work and also we've spoken to many women who have gone for promotions. We see an improved metabolic function. As I said, it improves, it can help with insulin resistance. It can help with energy. We see a lot of people that are then getting out and they're moving and they're getting stronger. We're looking long-term with the strength. So the muscle strength and the bone strength, we're looking at a decreased risk of falls. Again, we know that improving exercise, so there's good data that improving exercise decreases your risk of breast cancer amongst many other health conditions. And we also find, going back to the main condition of hypoactive sexual desire disorder, that we, we see that relationships improve. And again, this helps to improve the relationships with everyone within the household, not just on partners. And there's work going on at the moment looking at the impact on long COVID and we're finding a significant beneficial response to the symptoms of long COVID. When you look at the symptoms, it's not hard to see why. These are, there is very little data on testosterone, but these are, there are little snippets of data coming through. So again, there's information that it could help, potentially help with autoimmune conditions. There's a fantastic medic who is doing work at the moment where she's treating women with advanced breast cancer with aromatase inhibitors and testosterone and getting really quite incredible results. We see a lot of women with autonomic conditions that improve. And again, POTS is one of them very little data. I think there's data on three people, but it's something that we see time and time again. I've said before that we see a lot of people who have been labelled with fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue ME, that their energy starts to improve quite quickly, their strength, their mood. There was a study, I think it was done in the States, looking at testosterone with depression, and unfortunately it only ran for two months and we would say that you would really need to give this a good trial for four to six months as an, a significant effect on mood, on confidence. Very tiny study as well, but it would make sense with the receptors that it could have a beneficial effect on the prevention of heart failure. And again, when you're looking at the effect on the neurotransmitters, potentially there could be an effect, a positive effect, reducing the likelihood of dementia. So these are all very, very early days and it's Again, I just think it's incredibly sad that these haven't been researched. Sort of goes as a catch-22, I think, because there isn't a licensed product, then the research data isn't there. Because there isn't the research data there, it's difficult to get a licensed product. So I'm really hopeful that once there is a licensed product, that this will stop and we can start really looking into the possible benefits that this could have. I'll just go through a, this is a, a sort of quick case study again to see some something that we, or some body that we see very, very commonly, this type of presentation in the clinic. So this was somebody who was already on HRT. She came to see us really quite desperate. Um, she'd been, she was under the memory clinic and she was having investigations to see whether she'd got possible early onset dementia. She was unable to leave the house unless her husband was with her. So she wasn't going to any of the social groups. She wasn't, she just wasn't interacting at all. Significant loss of confidence, which is understandable. She had to leave post-it notes all around the house. She's having word finding problems, loss of concentration, loss of energy, and just felt absolutely dreadful and pretty hopeless. So we did her free androgen index, which again, when I said earlier, most people that we see will tend to feel well when the free androgen index is between two to three. So you can see that 0.4 is incredibly low. It may be marked normal in range, but when we're looking at the levels that we find therapeutic, it's very, very low. So we started her on the Androfem and did a review four months later, and it had just made a, a massive change. 
So she was able to go out. She felt confident to go out on her own. She was able to hold a conversation. She wasn't having to leave post-it notes. Her mood was better, which was not surprising. Sleep and her energy had improved. And the most striking thing she said to me was that if this hadn't worked, I had planned how I was going to end my life. So I would know I wouldn't be a burden to my family. So another quick case study. So this is a younger woman who had had surgical menopause. This was in the middle of COVID. So she was an ICU nurse, had already been signed off for three months with loss of energy, fatigue, loss of joy, which is a fairly common menopause symptom. And again, it wouldn't surprise me if it links to testosterone because testosterone has an impact on your dopamine. Loss of libido and her main reason for leaving work, she's just said, I'm not safe, my brain isn't working. So she was already on a higher dose of estradiol. She's a younger woman, she's 38, and younger women often will need higher levels of estrogen to maintain symptoms and levels. She was using the e-string that Sarah spoke about, so this is very convenient. You just change it every three months. She's got vaginal moisturizers. And then we started her on some tester gel sachets. So again, a very low free androgen index of 0.9. She chose the tester gel sachets um, because she thought there was probably that her GP may well be able to take them, take over the testosterone prescribing. And they'd indicated that this would be the one that they would be happy with. So again, got her going on it, reviewed her four months later, she's back at work. She got her joy back again. She was enjoying spending time with the family. She'd gone back to the gym. Sex drive had recovered. She still had slight loss of concentration, which was worrying her a little bit at work. So the free androgen index was 1.8. I'm just going back. So we just increased the dose ever so slightly to 0.75 mils. And when we saw her again, this had recovered as well. So again, you can be, you can titrate the dose up and down in the same way that you would with any other hormones. And again, after that, she would just have annual monitoring. So just one more. So again, we're seeing a lot of people who've been diagnosed with long COVID in the clinic and some fairly common symptoms. So fatigue, the breathlessness, complete loss of energy, and also this postural dizziness that we do see quite a lot as well. So she was already on her estrogen. She had a Mirena in situ, which was acting as contraception and the progestogen. Free androgen index of one. And again, we started her with the Androfem. And again, within four months, her energy had improved, the breathlessness had improved. So when we first spoke to her, she said she wasn't even able to venture out and just do a quick walk without being breathless. And when I spoke to her, she'd been out for a full day. So she still had a little of the fatigue, but significant difference. Cognition was sharper and she was back at work. So this is where we're up to with the NICE guidelines that at the moment, testosterone is only considered for women with low sexual desire if HRT alone is not effective. And although libido is incredibly important and we don't talk about it anywhere near enough, I just think it's a little bit sad that we're in 2021 and we're not looking at all of these other benefits. So I'm hoping that this has raised a little bit of clinical curiosity. There are resources again on the website that Sarah mentioned um, on the balanced menopause, and there are plenty of podcasts on there as well. So. I'm hoping that if nothing else, and I know that general practice is on its knees at the moment and do want to sort of say thank you to you all for coming along tonight. But if nothing else, even just going off and having a little read around this and being aware of it would be absolutely fantastic. So thank you. Thanks ever so much, Sarah and Zoe. It's been really great. Um, 
I hope there's been a lot of information there and I know we're sort of bang on the time that we were going to end, but I'm very conscious that I want to answer some questions. So um, we can't get through all the questions, but there's a, there's a few sort of themes. So I thought I'd just go through them. Firstly, before I start asking, uh, um, sort of asking the questions to Zoe and Zoe, there's been quite a few people asking about sort of uh, the product um, information. So this is with MHRA, because as Sarah quite rightly says, do not read the insert. And obviously that's linked to our prescribing as well with the BNF. And it's one of the big blockers for um, prescribing HRT and for women receiving it is the incorrect information that's given from the MHRA. Um, and uh, I can't even begin to explain how hard it is to get them to change, but there's a, some political pressure as well as some government pressure and some NHS pressure to change it. So, so that hopefully will happen. The, the changes with Carolyn um, Hall about the free uh, or um, reduced prescribing costs, she's really hoping will come in January, February time. So it is going to happen. It's not just an empty promise. Um, there's been a few questions about blood tests. Um, and when to do blood tests. And um, rather than asking Zoe and Sarah um, individually, I just wanted to try and reassure you some of the work I'm doing with NHS England is to try and minimize work and maximize productivity for women and, and obviously improve their future health. So although we have talked about blood tests or, or Sarah and Zoe have, baseline blood tests really are not often needed. Um, even to prescribe testosterone, we often don't do baseline because whenever we have done them, they're always low. Um, and so um, also even some of the blood tests to, um, that are recommended in NICE, the FSH levels, even in younger women, often in clinical practice, we don't do them because it doesn't change what we do. If someone's there in front of us with very obvious perimenopausal or menopausal symptoms, I think it's cruel to send them off to have blood tests. Um, so, um, but the, someone was asking about doing a blood test for FAI and um, we will be sharing the slides and it is a ratio. So you can't do a blood test. It's on the FHBG and testosterone levels. Um, so, so people have been asking um, about the, the um, dosing. So obviously you were saying some people need higher doses of estrogen, especially younger, young, younger people. If they're on a combination patch, so Everol Combi, for example, or, or um, even Sequi or Conti, and they're enjoying it, they're fine, but they're getting some systemic, um, you know, vasomotor symptoms, for example, you think they're still estrogen deficient, what would you do then? Yeah, so you can top up a combined preparation, and it's, again, it's not licensed, but so many things aren't licensed, it doesn't mean they're wrong. Um, so using either one or two measures of gel or a 25 or 50 microgram patch, on top of uh, Everell Sequi or Everell Conti is, is fine. You don't need to um, routinely increase the amount of progestogen if you do that, unless they start bleeding, then you need to review things. Um, but some women actually, if you explain the benefits of having the separate hormonal parts or body identical, they may actually want to make a switch anyway. But So there are options. Yeah, and, and um, like you say, there's not a maximum dose of estrogen, is there, that can be prescribed? No, absolutely not. It, a bit like if you think of uh, thyroxine prescribing, um, that you know you have a huge broad range of, of um, doses there. So a woman needs what she needs, and it's there's no point taking HRT if you're not either going to solve the symptoms or reduce the future, um, you know, future health risks of the menopause. So it's far riskier to inadequately treat someone than it is to properly treat them. Um, yeah. And I think that's really reassuring, actually, also you saying about um, oestrogen on its own actually lowers risk of breast cancer. So there's no risk of increasing. We've got transdermal, doesn't increase risk of clot. And I know actually when I started HRT, I was still getting vasomotor symptoms and I, um, I did have my oestrogen level done and it was 110, which was quite low. And so my consultant said, double your patches. And I was quite scared then, actually. Um, but actually, sometimes it's not... Um, what we're getting in it's how we absorb it as well and skin type can be very different can't it and some people find changing from a patch to gel even if it's the equivalent dose can make quite a difference can i just say as well louise on that one because we see a lot of people that come through the clinic don't we on very very low doses of estrogen and almost with the estrogen progesterone balance you're going to experience more of the progesterone side effects because you haven't got that balance 
So very mm. often all we need to do is just a tiny tweak in the estrogen and it evens a lot of the symptoms out. Yeah, so a lot of people who might think they're progesterone intolerant might tolerate their progesterone more with a higher dose of estrogen as well, mightn't they? Mm. Um, there's a few people that we have been asking about, because um, I know NICE guidance have, say that we can consider testosterone if a woman's got reduced sexual desire when on HRT. So a lot of people have been saying, well, what about the, the, the sort of level of estrogen or do you measure a, a level of estrogen before starting HRT and uh, sorry, before starting testosterone and um, can we use testosterone on its own without um, without estrogen or can we prescribe it at the same time so what are your feelings about and I, that? I think it makes more sense if you're perimenopausal then you may well have enough estrogen and progesterone around already and that makes more sense that if you're getting because again when we see people that come through with and again it's the cognitive fatigue it's just that fatigue it's that everything is an effort and you say what were you doing three years ago I was running marathons and now I can't get off the sofa so again, if they haven't got other symptoms that indicate sort of estrogen deficiency, then yes, that makes absolute sense to use testosterone alone. And we're hoping to speak to one of the chronic fatigue clinics soon to, to look into that possibly being on their pathways. So if you're postmenopausal, if there isn't as much estrogen around, then it makes more sense clinically, biologically, to have a little base layer of estrogen because otherwise you can break down the testosterone into estrogen. And we would say that's a bit of a waste of testosterone. Waste of money, isn't it? it? Well, especially um, if they're paying for it. But, yeah. but, but, but increasingly, I do see quite a lot of women, and I'm sure you both the same, who know about testosterone, and they would really like it at the same time. And I think some of it is down, as Sarah said, to shared decision-making and seeing what they want as well, because it is the third hormone. And even Carolyn Hall today at a meeting was saying it's like a two-legged Ooh. it's just yeah, ridiculous we lose so it, yeah it we lose three and replace two yeah it doesn't quite make sense, sense does it no and i suppose again i mean a lot of the people that we see are again there's a big financial impact because they've been out of work for a long time and if it's generally due to the testosterone i think the estrogen lots of people can to some extent muddle along with but the testosterone just floors people when it's gone because again it's you, you just can feel very unsafe if your thought your cognitive processing has has really been affected then this is the reason we see lots of people who've had to take time off work and with them because it can take a few months to alleviate the symptoms then i'm more keen to start it straight away yes yeah there are some people asking about um, the role of progesterone or utrogestan for women who may be body marina um, or had a hysterectomy some women like, when we've talked a bit about progesterone intolerance, but some people actually like progesterone, don't they? And um, there are some benefits. So Sarah, what do you think about that? Yeah, so um, I mean, progesterone can be quite a marmite type drug, can't it? There's some that absolutely hate it and some that absolutely love it, but there are neutral ones. So um, usually if you have a Mirena coil in, um, although it's a synthetic progesterone, you usually get some of the, um, the benefits of, of the natural progesterone. Um, but there will be a few women who will still not sleep very well or feel quite anxious despite their myrena coil. So if you know that you've optimised their oestrogen and you've considered testosterone and optimised that if you're using it and you're still a bit stuck and you've done sort of basic sleep hygiene measures, then it's not wrong to try an addition of Eutrogestan. And I think trying it for three months on top of the um, uh, myrena coil is, is a okay thing to do it's also quite a good option if you're coming to the expiry date of the coil so if you're near your five-year anniversary and especially in the pandemic women haven't easily been able to get their myrena coil changed and we'll say we'll keep the myrena coil in but we can't now assume that that's going to give you endometrial protection but why don't you just take some eutrogestan as well and they'll either decide that they love the eutrogestan instead therefore at some point in the future they can have their myrena removed or they if they don't particularly like it they can get another marina coil done in a non-rush uh, scenario and then the women that have had a hysterectomy again um, I, I say to them structurally you don't need progesterone but again if you're still struggling with sleep and or anxiety and we've already covered the basis that I've just mentioned before then 
um, I do sometimes give you to just Anne on a trial basis and some of them actually do really well with it and actually they really miss it and I think what we've really got to open our minds up to I think it's difficult isn't it in medicine because we're very guideline driven and it's it, it guidelines uh, uh, deal with populations but they don't deal with individuals and actually we need to if at all possible individualize care and actually some women do brilliantly with estrogen and that's like their number one hormone some women it's the testosterone and actually some women is actually the progesterone so again if we think about the three-legged stool and mm -hmm. try and adjust the lengths of the legs of that stool for each individual we will end up with a balanced seat that we won't fall off of yeah but, but the, it's very unbalanced often in the perimenopause isn't it even when you were saying the, that, place, the yeah. ladder sometimes it is like chasing a moving target and I always say to women it's a lot easier when they're officially menopausal we never yeah. know when that is of course if they're on HRT um but at once their own hormones are stopped messing and interfering it can be a lot easier but perimenopause is often very stormy time even when they're on hrt as well um i think that's why um, about, just sorry. i think that's why testosterone is my favorite because it behaves even during perimenopause doesn't it whereas the other hormones yeah. are wild absolutely you don't get the great big swings <laughs> that it's the, the high estrogen and then very low estrogen i think that really triggers and affects a lot of people um, um and just to reassure you before we stop doing baseline um blood test for testosterone we we did it and we audited in our practice and we've got so many women that we've had we found that uniformly their testosterone and their shbg so therefore their free angelin index was uniformly low and as zoe says generally a level up to five is fine but we do, everyone's different and we've got some patients who are quite extreme athletes and they feel so much better when their levels were like 4.55 where and women with PCOS probably often have it like to have a higher level because that's what they're used to whereas other women they might have a level of 1.2 or 1.5 and they feel fantastic so we're not aiming for a level it's all about symptoms and so that's how we can minimize blood tests um, someone asked about DHEA. Obviously, we can use vaginal DHEA, so the intravasal pessaries. What about systemically? Would you ever consider DHEA Zoe, rather than testosterone? No, because it breaks. It doesn't. Again, I think it's just trying to keep everything as clean as possible, isn't it? And you're, you're. That's a, a sort of a precursor. Whereas it, to me, it makes more sense to split the hormones into the the end product in a way. Absolutely, because then you know what you you know what you're getting then don't you mm. and I think it's and it's quite weak DHEA as well mm. so you have to use quite a lot we we do see some women who are on DHEA who have come from bioidentical clinics but they're often in quite a mess actually and mm. um, we don't prescribe it obviously because it's compounded we wouldn't ever prescribe that those um, hormones somebody asked about Tostran um, which obviously contains testosterone doesn't it but it's just harder to get the right dose isn't it though? I think it's yeah because similar to the tester gel pump pack um it's your so again it's a, a sort of a um it's usually two to three times per week and so what we'd like is nice sort of consistent levels whether that's very up and down and we've had to with some formularies when they've been changing the pathways they will only agree to tostran because of the problem with the sachets so i've sort of figured well some testosterone is better than none and then hopefully when Androfem becomes licensed or tester gel, it will just slot nicely into that pathway that's already up and running. Yeah, and we are, we're hoping that Androfem will be licensed sometime next year, hopefully, and they are making it as a pump rather than the, um, the tube, which again will be easier for people to do. So I'm just going to answer a few more questions because um, I'm conscious of time. Um, People have been asking about Uchidestan again and contraception or if people are on, you know, it's a really difficult time, isn't it, contraception when people are perimenopausal. But if we give Uchidestan continually, continually and people are amenorrheic, what do you think, Sarah? I know it's not licensed, but a lot of things we do are off license. Yes, it's a standard response, isn't it? Well, it is a license, but it seems pragmatic and sensible. So, um, yeah, it's 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 yeah if you're using it continuously and you've gone a whole year without any bleeding um i think we can be fairly confident that that's okay but i think as long as you share that that thought process with your patients then they can make the ultimate decision of whether that's good enough and reassuring enough or whether they would rather actually add a mini pill or switch to the myrena or um you know use barrier methods mm. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are some people that will give progesterone and a synthetic progestogen, but actually the more you know about synthetic progestogens, the more you realise how nasty they are and how much you want to avoid them really, other than the marina coil, of course. Yes. So, I think there's some, like migraine sufferers, for example, they can do very well, especially in the perimenopause, if they are no longer ovulating. So sometimes Cerazep, for example, can be really useful in perimenopausal migraine sufferers who need contraception and also would like HRT. Um, mm. but, you know, that, that can be a good option. And obviously that is licensed as contraception, but it just doesn't have the kind of the cardiovascular benefits that micronized progesterone does. But that's, you know, it's, it's all different risks and benefits for different people. Isn't it? Talking about cardiovascular, actually, a few people have said blood pressure. Obviously, everyone um, every year has a blood pressure done. Why do we bother with blood pressure when people are on transdermal oestrogen, microbiome progesterone, uh, and or testosterone? Is there a is there a need for us to do it? No, no, there is no. There's <laughs> <laughs> no need really over and above. Um, Just a general health check. That all women should, you know, all people should mm. have a blood pressure check every so often, but it doesn't affect whether you can start HRT as long as you use body identical or whether you can continue it. So it's it's a reassurance um, really. And um, we know that what we want to do, especially uh, for those of us that work in a private healthcare setting is that we really want to support our women to go back into the NHS and get their HRT from their GP. So we will do anything to avoid any barriers to that. And if that means that we have to, um, do their blood pressure just to tick that box then we do it but um you know making sure that that, that the woman and ideally her healthcare professional know that we're we're um you know it's not actually necessary it's um for their menopause care I mean, it's, it's it's good practice just yeah just for cardiovascular risk but anyone who has raised blood pressure can still safely have transdermal absolutely like raised progesterone it might lower it as well and actually as Sarah quite rightly says Cochrane data say it reduces cardiovascular risk more effectively than a statin it's, um, so um somebody put about tapering they wanted a webinar actually on tapering hrt which fills me with horror because um, I, I wouldn't have enough to talk about for a webinar but actually there's this whole thing about people want uh, thinking we should be coming off hrt and that's partly the mhra have said lowest dose shortest length of time which actually contra indicate or contradicts all the guidelines and everything else so i'd like to ask you about that Sarah, but then also then Zoe, after that, just these are your last two questions because I know it's late, um, about vaginal oestrogen actually. So I was reading this article about overactive bladder in women in this week's BMJ. I don't know if you've only seen it. And it's quite nice actually, because it has a little ladder, which I thought Sarah would like. And it talks about conservative treatment first. So just caffeinated drinks or whatever, bladder training, pelvic floor, absolutely sensible advice. Number two, they put vaginal oestrogen. So I think, gosh, that's absolutely brilliant. But then when it talks about vaginal oestrogen, it does say um, that it can help with urinary symptoms. And then it says interrupt treatment and review at least annually to assess the need for continued use. Um, and so I just I'd like to ask you, Zoe, after I've after Sarah's answered a bit, your comments about interrupting vaginal <laughs> I think um, there's a fantastic book. I don't know whether I have it hand. Uh. It's called Me and My Menopausal Vagina, which every healthcare professional should read. And Jane Lewis, who wrote the book, there's a, a brilliant quote in that that says, if you don't water the plants, how do you expect them to thrive? Mm. And it's exactly the same with localised vaginal oestrogen, that your ovaries are not going to suddenly become all sparkly and be oestrogenising the pelvic floor again. So why on earth would you be doing this? It, it, it actually seems very barbaric um, and my husband who's a urologist said well that's what we've always been taught to do but there's no reference actually in in this and the bmj but, but vaginal um dryness or, or vaginus, dryness related symptoms progress with time if they're not treated so there's absolutely this, no reason at all yeah and as you we sort of said before if we had more awareness of this if we had more awareness of vaginal health just think of i mean we've all been to visit so many people in residential and nursing homes who are on continence pads admitted with urosepsis just miserable and huge falls as well if you're getting up to go to the loo all the time all of that could be avoided if yeah. we were talking about it earlier absolutely so sarah 
finally then, coming off HRT. Coming off HRT, <laughs> yes. Um, it depends really why you've gone on it in the first place. So if someone's gone on it because their symptoms are problematic and they're not actually interested in the future health benefits, then we know that the average woman will have menopausal symptoms um, for about four to seven years. And so the, 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 the woman may decide to um, try and see what it's like without it. There aren't any hard and fast uh, guidelines or evidence about whether that needs to be done gradually or can be done quite abruptly, but it makes more sense, I think, to do it in a gradual way. So at least if symptoms are gonna come back, it's not a big shock. Um, but if a woman is actually invested in the idea that it's gonna help her future health, then actually she doesn't need to come off it anyway. We, we tend to find that as women get older, that they do need less. So um, I um, always remember um, in the clinic a few years ago, one of your patients, Louise, I think was well into her 90s and she bounded up the stairs, um, which is a quite a considerable staircase to come up. And um, she's only on half a measure of gel every day, but she's taken HRT since she was in her late 40s and she's just been able to gradually reduce the amount. And so, you know, we know that the reason she was able to bound up those stairs was because she's used the HRT for that time. Um, but no, so, it, you know, it's, there's, there's not any hard and fast guidelines, but a gradual de decrease seems fine. And many women actually may decrease it because they've maybe got the wrong idea in their head about they need to come off it after five years or when they get to 60. And actually they then feel awful. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's people come back then and say, actually, can I restart? And, and we need to be very, um, you know, um, you know, happy to do that because it makes more sense for her and for society and for the health you know the NHS as well. Absolutely which goes back to what you were saying at the beginning really is that it's it's about individualization of care but it's also having the right amount there's almost no point being on HRT if you're on too low a dose because it's very pro-inflammatory if you haven't have got enough estradiol in the body so I'd like to thank you all. I can see that there's still a lot of you that have carried on listening to the questions and we have recorded the session. Um, I'd like to thank formerly Zoe and Sarah because it's a huge amount of effort putting together presentations such as this and um, I really appreciate them. And in the background, I'd also like to publicly thank Lucy who is doing a huge amount of work for the society. So thank you very much, Lucy. And I'm very relieved we have no, had no technical issues today as well. So um, we look forward to seeing you all in January. So have a lovely Christmas and um, thanks again for all your support and kind words. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.